Introduce this. Uh, the, here we go. But give him some time to talk, will you? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am John Keller with Edward Jones. We make sense of investing. And it's my pleasure to introduce Ken Parrish. He's from uh, Franklin Templeton. Uh, great partner. I've been working with him for over a year. And uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this presentation. And obviously, we're not selling anything today. Everybody that works is contributing to Social Security. And it's a very important choice that you have to make to make sure your retirement is properly funded. So uh, there's a handout for everybody, uh, and it's my pleasure. Ken's been with Templeton, Franklin Templeton for over 17 years. He's a great partner. I can give you a long thing. Uh, been in the industry for 19. He's based out of Little Rock, Arkansas, but he covers Tennessee, and I'm proud to introduce him. Ken? I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate you getting out of bed and coming out and maybe thinking we can go back to sleep when I'm talking about <laughs> uh, I promise I won't try to make this uh, entertaining uh, as it may be. Keep in mind, I don't represent the government, so don't throw your pens at me. Okay? Um, the Social Security Administration, of course, uh, as you know, they spend some time trying to educate a little bit through some pamphlets that they'll send you in the mail. If you've been to SSA.gov, what I consider the black pit of despair, um, you may never return from there. So we tried to kind of pull those things together uh, and put what we think was a little bit of a roadmap, at least get you informed. My job is simply to make you as dangerous as possible when you walk in and make those decisions. That will affect the income that you receive for the remainder of your years. And that's really simply how you should think about it. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, listen, I think it's all about history up front, okay? You have to know where Social Security came from, how it's evolved through the years. One of the things that I always make sure that I uh, get out in front of the people that I speak in front of is this. The television set is not your financial advisor. It will not drive you in the right direction, and in most cases it will instill a great deal of fear. As I stand in front of baby boomers and those that are even a little bit younger that are considering Social Security, what's the immediate thought? I'm taking it as early as I possibly can. Haven't you seen the news? It's going away. It's an empty shell that politicians borrow from consistently, right? It's been going on for years. Let's truly look at facts. That's what I'll promise you today is where we're at. But you have to go back and really look at history once again as we walk through this we don't really need to talk about when it was brought out or early retirement. By the way, that is early retirement. It's why we've got to put up. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go forward. But it was really during the Nixon administration when they had realized that they hadn't accounted for inflation that one of the first issues in Social Security arose. Okay? Uh, they found out that the same checks that you were receiving in 1940 uh, were the identical checks that you were receiving in the 1970s. They had never accounted for inflation. We remember these headlines. So under the Nixon administration, they increased your benefits by 10, 15, 20%, only to realize a short amount of time later when Reagan took office that there was a flaw in that formula. And when Reagan took office, he was almost immediately ushered into a room and told that Social Security would be bankrupt within two years. The presidential Blue Ribbon Committee was put together, it was headed by an obscure economist that no one had ever heard of before by the name of Alan Greenspan, who single-handedly solved that social security issue. Um, now we talk about today's issues. One, 2010 was the first year that uh, the FICA tax, and if you're not familiar with the FICA tax, of course, that is the 6.2% currently that comes out of your paycheck. Oh, by the way, business owners, the additional 6.2% comes from you for a total of 12.4, right? You're getting taxed on both sides. I'm not saying I want to be in your shoes. I'm kind of happy to be on my side of the desk when we talk about that, right? Uh, but all that being considered, that was the first year that all of that tax collected did not cover benefits paid plus administrative costs. Now, I don't often say this in the same sentence. The government did something smart. They realized that there was going to be a shortfall. So they bought government securities, tucked it inside of that account, and it is the interest on those bonds that are currently covering that shortfall. Uh, 2021, the interest on the trust fund will no longer cover that shortfall, and principal must be tapped. 
one more. By 2033, the trust fund will be entirely exhausted and FICA will only be able to cover somewhere around 75% of promised benefits plus administrative costs, okay? I promised you just the facts. Now, those are the facts as they are stand today. One more, John. I did not come here for you to think about throwing your pen at me or to rush the Social Security office or maybe put together some band of hooligans in a garage and go after the government, right? That's not what we're looking for. What I will tell you is many are unaware that this even exists, but every year, we get a Social Security Trustees report. You know why it doesn't exist? Because that's really good sleeping material, right? It's a government document. And what you're going to find is that currently the actuarial deficit, or a fancy name for this is the shortfall where we currently are inside of Social Security, is at 2.88%. Now, if I asked you where it was in the mid-90s, what would your answer be? If I told you it was somewhere around 2%. Right? So this is not something that's shooting out of control. It's not a juggernaut. It's not moving at an exceptional rate. In fact, 13 to 14's year-over-year -year move was 0 0.05. This one was a little steeper as we look from 14 to 15 at 0.16. What we would tell you is this. Put things into perspective. Reagan had two years. We have how many? 2,033 folks. Right? Now here's the thing. We've never heard it from a politician. Why? Politicians don't run on raising taxes. They simply don't because they don't win when you do that, right? And so what we think that they'll actually do, although it's manageable at this point, is they're going to kick the can down the road and address it somewhere around two years prior to that. We'd love to see any of you that, any of you that have a direct line to a politician vote and vote often, right? And say the words actuarial deficit. Let them know that you're familiar with the shortfall in Social Security and let them know that you're familiar that no one has addressed it at this point, okay? The current state, I think, is important as we look towards making some decisions. The first thing that we're going to talk about is this. I think I highlighted, hopefully I said it loud enough, clear enough, italicized, bold, exclamation points after it. What we're talking about is that 62 is not the day that you stop showing up for work and immediately rush down to the Social Security office and tell them to turn the juice on. That's simply not the right direction for you to go in most cases. Now, Keep in mind, as we went back through the history, Social Security was designed originally for one reason, to make sure that the poorest in our country, or I'm sorry, the oldest in our country, never lived below the poverty. Okay? So, I'll caveat that with this. If you need it, go get it. Right? But for those of us that have the ability to make some considerations as we move towards those years, there are some practices that we'll talk about. Once again, consider when you file. Uh, you can go ahead and open that whole thing up, John, if you'd like. Okay, this is my friend Lou. He's 59, right? I've got some statistics in front of you. Usually this is a very slow reveal, but uh, I'm watching the clock as we move through this, right? The first is if he files at 62, by the way, my cheats are up in the top left-hand corner as you look across that, right? He's 59 currently, his full retirement age. How many of you are baby boomers in the room? Raise your hand. All right, we've got the right crap, John. So, um, so you guys are all thinking about this, considering these choices as we move forward. Lose a baby boomer as well, which means he has months after his year. All of you baby boomers will realize when you go to ssa.gov or look at it, you're 66 in some month. Why? In all the government's wisdom, what we realized is that it takes them roughly 12 years to make a decision. And what that means is to go from 65 to 66 is a retirement age. They went 65 in one month, 65 in two months, 65... 12 years it took them to move it all the way to the 66 and get everybody underneath of that fold, right? So my friend Lou here, 66 in two months is his number. His full retirement age, or FRA, if you will, uh, benefit is 2496 If he decided at the age of 62, I'm just going, right? As we know, there's a discount. Do any of you know how deep that discount can actually be? It can be an astounding number, but unfortunately what we look at is this. Ah, it's just a monthly check, right? We see it as, I'm okay with $300 less or $400 less. What we've done on this chart is really show you from a lump sum standpoint, if you simply live to your life expectancy, what that number will equate to over your life, and it can be very large. If I asked this gentleman in the front row, if you saw a suitcase with $250,000 in it on the side of the road, would you step over it and go, nah, that's not for me. I'd rather, I'd rather that empty suitcase over there, right? <laughs> Probably not. Right? So many people step past that once again. So if he takes his benefit at 62, he's now at 1571. Now here's where we start thinking about a few things. As I stand in front of baby boomers, I'll find two things are always true. The first is this. 
You were the greatest saving generation in the history of the United States. Pat yourselves on the back. That's amazing. And so what happens is you think you'll never outlive your retirement savings. You've got a nice nest egg. It's out there. Why? One leads to another. You all, most, gross generalizations, right? Most dramatically underestimate your mortality. You're basing your life expectancy on your parents or your grandparents. Now, your parents and your grandparents, they were lucky if when they were in retirement, or in retirement 10, 15, if they were some of the lucky few, 25 years in retirement. Today, it is a much larger number. Right? Let's play a game. Raise your hands if you know somebody who's 60. It's funny, right? <laughs> Keep them up if you know somebody who's 70. 80? 90? Who knows a centarian? Keep your hands up. What I'm going to tell you is that the nation's 90 and older population tripled over the last few decades and continues to grow. Today, you must plan for your retirement years to be 25, 35, if you're one of the lucky few, 45 years in retirement. It's a very different scenario. Now, what I'll tell you is, is how the government looks at you first, right? Because I don't want you thinking to yourself, oh gosh, that guy told me I'm living to 102. I better put a whole lot more money and I think I'm going to work until I'm 85, right? That may not be the case. Because what I will tell you is we all still have a mortality table. Until the government sees us, it's the number that we're expected, right? Our life expectancy, if you will. Gentlemen, how old are we expected to live to at this point? 82, right? Ladies, you know they're the superior species, right? Stronger, faster, smarter, right? 84, two years after that. And that is your mortality table. So what I will tell you is, if I were to put this in a synopsis and quickly go through it, it's this. The later, right? In every case scenario, the later you wait to file, if you simply make it to your life expectancy, 82 for a man, 84 for a man, you will always make more money. Now, the question always comes up, where's the break even, right? If I file earlier, more checks equals more money, right? No, that's not actually the case, right? For a couple of different reasons. One, we're gonna talk about what delayed retirement credits are, okay? Um, as we walk through this scenario and make you fully aware of that, which is an 8% bump, right, uh, from 66 to 70. It's something we need to be fully aware of. But as you can see, a 32% increase, and that's always the question, how do you get to such a big number from 66 to 70, right? That's a 32% increase. Why? Because the government's actually allowed us this. For every year after the age of 66, you delay filing. They will give you a delayed retirement credit and 8% guaranteed increase in your benefits. Now, four years simple interest, not compounded, that's 32% increase in your benefits, can make a substantial difference. And what I will tell you is the break-even points are quite simple. It is about 77 from 66 to, uh, I'm sorry, 62 to 66, so that gap, right, making up for the shortfall, the discount that you will get. Your break-even point is 78 from 66. So if you make it to 78 or 79, let's say that, right, you've actually made more money than you would have in the opposite scenario. Everybody asks for that break-even, right? Where do I start making uh, money above and beyond what I would have if, in fact, I had filed in 62? John, we can move on. Um, I'm not going to belabor this point. Uh, one more time. What we're going to cover now is, in the last few, is only about six slides. But what I'm going to tell you is, these are the advanced social security practices. You may have bit, uh, read bits and pieces on a few of these. We're going to go through all the scenarios. There are eight or nine. Most people, if they're quite intelligent in regards to social security and the workings and all that are out there, know about four or five, right? So we're going to work through all of these. I promise you, it seems like more than it's actually going to be. It's not going to be too bad, right? So how, when, uh, and whose record you claim social security on, and it can really dramatically affect, once again, that amount that you're going to receive for <coughs> Right. So, we're going to talk about Bob and Carol. Baby boomers, if I talk about Bob and Carol first, who's my second couple? Ten hours. There we go. Perfect. Uh, so, Bob is uh, 66. He's worked for lots of big technology firms. Never quite hit it big, right? Didn't make the big money. A little bitter about that. Carol, she spent a little time in the home working for uh, or, or working with her children. But she did earn 40 quarters, right? So, she is due a Social Security check. Right at the end of this period. Here's the riff, and here's how we're going to enter this scenario. Uh, he's sleeping on the couch. She's a little mad at him. I'll tell you why. He's decided, he saw a seminar just like this, he's decided that he's going to wait to seven. 
He never hit it big in the technology firm, and in fact, he remembers a phone call from a guy from the guy who had started a company in his garage, named it after a fruit. Right? He said, "No, I'm not working for you. You don't have a college degree." Okay? So he's very bitter at life. Um, Carol, on the other hand, she's like, I spent all this time in the home with the kids. My thoughts are this. That couch is 20 years old. It smells like dog. I want to travel to go see the kids. It's time for me to stop showing up. I want my check right now. So they run down the office to my friend uh, John's office, and they say, John, I want you to tell him he's stupid, and I want him to tell her she's stupid, all that good stuff, right? He loves those appointments. So he goes, listen, let me do a little homework. Here's a hypothetical scenario, and let's see if we can work this out for you. And here's what it does look like. If Carol walks in, Based on her own work record, and you can see my cheats are always up in the top left hand, her full benefit at full retirement age would be $700. She gets a discount because she is going to try and file at 62. So she's going to get $525. Her thoughts are quite simple. That's $525. I never have to ask him about it. It's got my name on the check. He can't do anything about it. That's mine. Right? And so she's considering it. He says, wait, wait, wait. Okay? You may be available to take a spousal benefit. And he looks it up and he says, no, you can't at this point. Why? He hasn't filed yet. One of the things you have to be aware of is if your spouse does not file, you cannot file that spousal benefit while they are still on this plan. Okay? It's a different scenario when they leave the plan. Um, now, he could, uh, what, what John puts together is this. Listen, what you can do is, John, you can go down to Social Security Office, SSA, right? Or SSA.gov, you can file online. You can fill out your paperwork and immediately suspend it. Right, bottom right hand corner, write a box, write suspended. It's a silly loophole they make you jump through, right? For one reason, so that your spouse can file. And what they'll do if he suspends it is they immediately check that box as if he's filed, so his spouse can go get that spousal benefit. His will continue to grow at the rate that you would expect it to, right? That 8% a year is going to be for late retirement credits. Here's one of the things you have to be aware of consider their ages. Any of these advanced social security practices that we're going to talk about. They don't matter. Throw them out of your memory if you plan on filing prior to your full retirement age. Okay? You have to make it to 66 for any of these to matter. We strategically put these, these, uh, these birth dates and these ages together. He is 66. He has the option of going and doing that. His wife, who is younger than 62, what you'll realize is this. If you file prior to 66, in most cases, you are locked in at that number for the remainder of your years. That's your number. You don't get to make changes. You don't get to make fancy decisions. Okay? And so, one more. If, in fact, she does go down and, and Bob says, okay, I'm going to go down, file, suspend, she now gets, and let's do the math, half of his, this was 2000 that full retirement age benefit, right? Half of that's $1,000. She still gets the discount for filing early, but it ends up being $200 more than it originally would have been, right? Win-win. He gets off the couch, she's happy, she gets to see the kids, she gets a new couch, right? Um, so, assuming cost of living adjustments, that's what COLA is, at 3%, I'll tell you, you are not guaranteed 3%. You look actually with the core inflation in terms of those adjustments. Some years will get zero, some years will get one and a half, some years will get three. We calculated it at three as if inflation had took off, and that's the, that's the case, right? And so, uh, at 3%, Bob's benefit would be 29.71, or a little above 32% difference. Right? You waited from 66 to 70. Okay, One more. Um, the adjustment of 3% at Carol's benefit, right? and that's just moving up, cost of living adjustments once again, hers just continues to grow at that, at that annual clip. Okay? Any questions on, well, we'll save questions until the end, actually. Let's jump into the second. As promised, here's Ted Nallis. Ted Nallis uh, pursued well-paying careers. Uh, they just retired. Uh, Alice is actually the high wage earner between the two of them. She was the administrator of a hospital complex. Ted, an accountant, did pretty well for himself as well. Here's the riff in this situation. Alice has gone to see her cardiologist, <coughs> and he said, listen, you're not a donor. Things don't look great. Enjoy the remainder of your years. Okay? And so they sit down, they have a powwow, and they basically make a decision. Listen, we've got money. It's earmarked. Uh, all of those things. We know that there's a potential that, that, that some terrible things could happen. Let's get a couple extra thousand dollars a month and just do whatever we want. Travel, travel the world, whatever it is, start a new business. They just want a couple extra thousand dollars a month. So they go to their trusted advisor, John, and he basically says, okay, let me put a couple of scenarios together. It's terrible. I want to help you guys in this situation the best that I possibly can. So here is that Social Security scenario. <coughs> Option A is this. It's a knee-jerk reaction. We find it out all the time. 
The more money that a client can get up front, they will take it. Trust me. They're not great savers. And so they immediately go, well, Alice was the high wage earner. I want her check right now, right? And he said, let's run it based on that scenario. So Alice's full benefit, once again, cheats up in the top left-hand corner, 2500 They take hers. Now, they use another that John recommends, and he says, listen, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. You won't get too much under what her benefit would, or his benefit would be, um, but there's something called file and amend the scope of your application. It's a fancy word that SSA came up with that basically says, I want choices. Mind you, they're both 66, so they can make these choices. And here's their choice, right? Um, they take uh, hers. He goes, I don't want mine right now, even though I'm full retirement age. I want her benefit because I know I'm going to get an 8% increase in my benefits going forward. Okay? And so the scenario looks like this, 2500 for Alice today. He gets half, his 1250 of her full benefit, right? As they go through the years at age 70, here's what happens. Uh, hers just continues to grow with that 3% cost of living adjustment. His now jumps 32%, right? Cost of living, those types of... Uh, by the age of 78, um, now hers is once again just growing at the cost of living. His is growing at the cost of living as well. Um, uh, but here's the, 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 the really sad part. Alice dies at 78. And so I'll ask you a trick question. How much money does Ted live on for the rest of his life? The higher of two benefits, right? And so you only get one. Keep that in mind. You've seen this snag a whole lot of people. Um, and so ultimately what you're going to find is um, uh, John goes, listen, I want to run another scenario for you. Okay, We're going to flip-flop this, something a little counterintuitive. We're going to take Alice's first, right? or, or, or we're going to leave Alice's and let hers grow. Compounding on a higher number is always a higher number. right? And so ultimately what they decide is, okay, we're going to take Ted's, um, uh, 1800 It's much less up front, about $1,000 less as we know, but it's still met their goals. A couple thousand dollars a month is what they were looking for, right? But my, what a difference it makes as you look at the remainder of this scenario. At age 70, we change. Alice is now 32% higher at 78. Uh, we see 4704, 25.6, for a total of 72.69. Now, here's my same question to you, and let me tell you how impactful this can actually be. If Alice dies at 78, now how much does she live off of? Maybe boomers, I'm going to ask you one thing. I'm going to ask you, if you underestimate your own mortality, can you speak for your spouse as well? Some of these decisions can be life-altering for whichever of you, right? I forget the statistic, but if you have a couple age 62, there's a 50% chance that one of you make it to 95. Is that an amazing thought process? You have to ensure the household has the ability to sustain, because what we find is this. We find that in the beginning, you have been a great saving generation, right? Ultimately, Social Security make up, may make up 15% of your overall income, right, in the beginning of your retirement years. But as you draw down, that drawdown scenario, what's called our distribution phase of our life, as that draws down, Social Security becomes a much larger portion of your income. And if you make it to 95 and the $1.2 million that was your number, right, that you wanted during that time, we've drawn that down to 200. And what I will tell you is, you don't know how much longer every time you get a checkup, the doctor's telling you you're pretty darn healthy, right? And so you don't know how long that's going to have to last and those types of things. What we would tell you is make some smart decisions. One more, if Alice is at 78, right? Here's the last two slides. Um, we're going to cover a couple of different things. This is Warren. Um, he's divorced from Joanne. I won't go into a whole backstory. We're running out of time here. But ultimately, let's look through the divorce and the death scenarios, okay? Uh, Warren was married for about 12 years to Joanne. You can go ahead and click through that, John. Um, and he runs in because she divorced him uh, years ago. He's never remarried, and he wants to know if he can file because he saw her on Facebook and realized she was unattractive or, or a, uh, an attractive as well as a, um, a, a, a successful attorney for many years. Okay, so uh, years of marriage needed to collect on your ex-spouse. Everybody's familiar with this. Ten, you have to be divorced for two, right, out of the marriage. Um, the maximum benefit is 50% of your ex-spouse's IRA after they file, okay? So even your ex-spouses, if you've never remarried, um, it's after you file. The earliest age of the divorce spouse can file is 62. You must be unmarried when you file if you marry afterwards. Why? They move you out of the divorced spouse column into the current spouse column, okay? They see you and categorize you as such. Now, what if Joanne were deceased? 
and you can just reveal that whole slide. The years of marriage needed for a widower to collect on a deceased spouse's work record, nine months. Okay, so what I'll tell you is this, if you, that's during a marriage. You only have to be married for nine months, right, when your spouse dies to be able to get their, 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 their uh, death benefit. Marry somebody rich. Oh. Well, it's good luck. <laughs> the earliest age a widower can file is 60 instead of 62, so it's a bit earlier, right? Uh, the maximum benefit is now 100% of your deceased spouse's work record. It's just like the last scenario, you get the higher two benefits. And if that's all that you have once you reach those, it's 100%. So the impact uh, benefit paid to another widow is none. Let me see if I can explain that to you. Let's say that Joanne, she's not so, uh, quite as sweet a lady as we thought. She's been a serial marrier her entire life and a heartbreaker, right? So she's married four or three other guys, right, after, after uh, uh, Warren, and they all lasted over 10 years. Okay. Um, ultimately, what you're going to find is every single one of them, if they never remarry, if she died, could get 100% of her work record. And don't they're not going to call anybody else. And oh, by the way, this is not why the Social Security Administration is having issues. It's not that widespread an issue. I just want you to be aware of that, right? Uh, the impact of remarriage, you must be unmarried when you file, or the, uh, the marriage must be able to get disregarded. Remarriage after age 60, there's zero impact. Okay, they're not going to keep you if you're in a widow situation from remarrying after that. Whew. There's more, but, but we're going to stop there, right? Um, uh, what I'll say is this, John and Ellen, and, and I don't know if there's time for questions. Uh, I will remain for a, uh, a small amount of time. I know everybody's got a unique situation. What I would tell you is this, put some thought into it. This isn't a knee-jerk reaction. It's not something that you should do. Take some time to do some research and make sure that you're making the best possible um, a decision for yourself. So with that, I'm a little bit over time. John, I appreciate it. In my office, we have software that if you have your your age, your spouse's age, you can go to ssa.gov and find out what your preliminary numbers are. We can plug that in the software and find the maximum point and the maximum filing ages for you. There's no charge for that. We'll be happy to do this for you. Troy? Uh, turn it back over to you. Thank you all very much.